first of all, let me uh, say that this is a very special time for me, personally, to be able to reflect and reminisce about Fatima Manisi, who, a person who has touched our lives in so many different ways. And I'm just really delighted that Zanelle, that you gave us this opportunity to, to, uh, to uh, the space to do this. It's very important for us to remember uh, the women who have contributed because we were told yesterday that women are the people who work hard. Bashu, was it? So, women, Bashu, the people who work hard. <laughs> um, I also want to thank Devaki because Devaki is always very passionate about, about uh, analysis, about remembering, about staying connected. She's always thinking of you wherever she is and saying, well, I haven't seen so-and-so for a long time. When can we get together? When can we think together? So that's really, uh, thank you, Devaki, for that. And thank you, Patricia, for a very nice poem that we received. I know she's not here now, but she will be told that, ah, you're there. <laughs> that poem was very touching about Fatima as we were planning this exercise. Um, I, I tend to like to tell stories, so I will tell you stories. I won't be too long. Um, when I was a student in the US, um, we had a cultural center in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where African students would meet uh, from time to time. When I arrived, I spent a year, 1970, 71, and I hadn't been to this center. So in 1972, we get a message. I can't remember now exactly who invited. Maybe Zanella did. I don't know. <laughs> we, we were invited to go and network at this uh, cultural center in the, in the evening. And we were to bring African food and music and to celebrate. So I went along, I carried my pot of food, arrived a little early. And so I found the door, but I didn't find any, nobody answered the door. So I sat on the step and uh, waited. It was early fall, so it was still warm and windy and very calm, you know, that sort of northern calm before the, the winter. And so I'm sitting there and I see from a distance a silhouette, literally, of someone walking very gracefully, inquiringly, looking at doors. And I said, okay, she may be trying to find uh, the door that I'm at. And because I didn't know what, who it was, I just know that it was somebody tall and very graceful and was walking very inquiringly. So she walked towards me and as she arrived, I saw she was carrying something very heavy, like a pot. She had cooked food in a very big round pot and she was carrying it towards this door. So she, as she came, I realized that she's a brown woman. I hadn't met her before. She definitely was African. So when she came along, she, she, we sat together just there on the steps for a minute. And then because Fatima was not one to be quiet for too long, <laughs> she said, my name is Fatima Manisi, who are you? I said, I am a Cholapala. I said, I see. She said, I see. Where are you from? I said, I'm from Kenya. And what about you? I'm from Morocco. I said, uh-huh, I've never been to Morocco. I don't think I've ever been to Kenya either, she said. Uh, she said, I'm a student at Brandeis University. And I said, I'm a student at Harvard. I'm studying anthropology. She said, oh, that's good. I just come in from Montreal. She had spent some time, I believe, at 
uh, McGill University. And my own brother, older brother, had spent time at McGill as well as a student. So it just gave me that fleeting memory of my brother at that school. So anyway, we sat and then we went inside. When the door was opened, we put our food on the table. It was a very large table. And then there was music and we started dancing. And you know, Fatima also liked music. So we danced for a bit and uh, she had couscous and the chicken and I had brought chicken and rice. So we sat there until our food got finished and we, I, I left and uh, we exchanged numbers. In those days we had no cell phones, so you exchanged real numbers. These days we have some airspace numbers. That we <laughs> so we changed, exchanged numbers. And then I said, I wonder when, when can we see you? When can we see you again? She says, oh, you know, Zanelli lives on Porter Square. I said, oh, who is Zanelli? She says, Zanelli Dlamini, she's at uh, Brandeis as well. I said, oh, and then um, she said, next week, we're going to go to Boston Commons. Uh, Zanella is calling us to go and march against apartheid. So we met at, Port at uh, Harvard Square, and we went down, she in her blue jeans, you know, ready to fight. And Zanella, in her quiet way, came along, <laughs> and then and I joined and we went to Boston Commons. And this was to be the beginning of several marches um, against apartheid, against Portuguese colonialism in Guinea-Bissau, against Portuguese in Mozambique, Zimbabwe. against Mozambique, and then Zimbabwe, then against, against the Portuguese in Angola, then, uh, then in support of Swapo. So we were busy women studying, but not forgetting that the continent needed to be free. And Fatima was very enthusiastic, so were we. This was something that really gripped us. And we spent time immersed in this hope, because really it was a hope for the future, of a different future for Africa. And we were delighted to have been part of this. Here we were in America, and then we joined with many American students who were also in my university, we formed a group that was calling for the divestiture of, of the university from the investments in South Africa that were oppressing the people here. So we were very busy with those kinds of things. And so that is sort of my first meeting with, with Fatima. Then the second was the, the marches. And then the third meeting, was the Wellesley Conference. I, I didn't see Fatima very frequently because we were both working on, on deadlines and so we were trying very hard to be students who finish. And then, so we, we, there was a big conference at Wellesley College, which is also not too far from Cambridge, um, which was a conference that followed the Mexico 1980, 1985 uh, nine, um, conference, the conference World Conference of International Women's Year, which was held in Mexico. So the follow-up to that conference was we went there. And um, I, I, I talk about this conference because one of the things that I had said I would do was to look at the rebellious side of Fatima. Fatima was not a person who was content with the status quo that she wasn't content with. She had to do something about it. And if there was injustice, she had to handle it immediately. So when we went to Wellesley Conference in 1976, we found that the way the organizers had arranged the conference was that all the women who were in the dais, who were going to be the chairs and the discussants and so on were women from America. And the women who were going to provide information were the likes of us. And women from South America, women from Middle East and so on. So the arrangement seemed to have been that 
we were going to provide the information that was going to help these women to teach feminist classes in their universities, but we had not been consulted. So of course, straight away, we rebelled and said that <laughs> this arrangement wasn't going to work. We have to discuss. We want to be members of the panel. Camera. Bye, Yasin. i just let you say goodbye and settle down for a minute. you give me a few minutes? Okay, so shall we continue? Uh, so at this meeting, we, 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 were, we met several African women. Maria Angelique Savane was there from Senegal, uh, Molara Gundipe from in, in Nigeria, Kese Awashike from Nigeria, uh, Felicia Kejoba from Nigeria, uh, Philomena Steady from Sierra Leone, um, myself from Kenya, Niara Sadar Kasa, who's a Amer black American who studied a lot, an anthropologist who studied in Nigeria. So we were all there and we were feeling uh, rather uh, put in the margins of this conference. So straight away we stopped the conference. We said this conference cannot go on. We have to discuss. We have to dialogue. <laughs> yeah, hello, we had to dialogue about what roles different people were going to play. And after the, the people who had funded the conference were there, there was a, a, an immediate turmoil in the opening because we refused to participate and we wanted a, a, a reorganization before it went on. And so uh, that day we had a different setup. We were involved in different places, paper pro providers, presenters, chairs of panels, discussants. We, we, dive, we, we, we shared the roles. And uh, it was a bit of a shock to the women who organized it, but they quickly understood that we were not going to budge. <coughs> so then the next thing we, we did together was from, from these, uh, from these kinds of experiences of being put in the margins and being in somebody's agenda, we decided that we should now develop our own platform. It's the Association of African Women for Research and Development, which was launched in Dakar, uh, in, in Zambia, but which then later was based in Dakar, and uh, Zen, Zen has already spoken about it. Uh, we were involved in now creating an association of research we, who is the objective to decolonize research, to be Pan-Africanist, work together across the region, and to network with our friends from abroad, but on our own terms. We were becoming very assertive at that point. And so we, we um, set up this organization based on, not on geography, not on race, not on ethnicity, not on religion, no, and, but we, we, we wanted to be an African women's organization. And, and it's now in 22 countries. So uh, it's, a, it's an organization that I think has had its challenges, but may now be revived through this new effort that Devaki was speaking about of reviving the women's movement and finding a new purpose for ourselves. Then comes the, in 1980, we, the Copenhagen Conference of the 1980, the mid-decade conference came along. So we went and the award, now we have our own platform. We took the conference, we took, uh, we took ourselves to Copenhagen. But there was a very nagging issue, a big nagging issue that a number of Western women had started to talk about and had become very involved in, which was uh, female circumcision then it was called, now it's female genital mutilation. We were extremely concerned as African women that this agenda, as it were, was hijacked and now was being discussed by women who were neither cut, nor from our region, nor who are going to face the future with us. 
And so we had to bring the debate back into our own continent. Uh, there was a woman who lived in Cambridge next to us who was very determined to say that, oh, African women who are educated in the West don't want to deal with this issue. Uh, we're not going to let them, uh, as it were, allow the African women to be cut because it was, the suggestion was that because we were educated in the West, we, we had privileged and therefore we didn't want to allow other women to, 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 to realize their um, uh, freedom. But the fact of the matter was, and again this is one of the core things that Fatima talked about all the time, you must control your agenda. You have to have an agenda that's meaningful to you and that is going to change the lives of women from all walks of life. Uh, and if you have the privilege of going to school, you can work with a woman from the village. It doesn't really stop you. And that's what is a model that we've all tried to copy, uh, to work together and take on the agenda and then have this dialogue with the women in the rural areas. So that's another thing that Nelly, why I was so happy with this meeting, the, the overall uh, WDB, because it was a space for dialogue for women of all walks of life. And we found a lot of commonality. Now, moving quickly, um, I want to say two things about Fatima's work. I think that Fatima, and I say thank you, Fatima, for the gifts of your mind and the gifts of your hands. through which you have now produced for us a body of literature and a body of information, which has given us a window into diversity of women, the lives of women, the lives of women under Islam, the similarities between women across the world. And this body of knowledge is not conventional wisdom, it is very new and nuanced information that helps us to understand the layers of the lives of women. Now, this brings me to the point that, um, as, as Fatima was always saying, and we're discussing this, African women have strength. We have the ground that we stand on. Our culture, as much as you think it's all oppressive, it's not. The ground we stand on is our culture. What we are, what we, we don't want women to be seen as victims always of something. Women are strong and they have a right to critique the culture and take what is good and move with it. Because no country, no people can really survive or live outside of their culture totally. You know that. And uh, Fatima, was the one that drew my attention to the need to separate critical analysis and religious ideology. At the moment, I hear a lot of young people. Are there many young people in here? Please, I'd like you to listen, because um, I think that too many people are sold on to the victim mentality. Oh, we're victims. Oh, we're poor. Oh, we're this. And as long as you remain a victim or see yourself as a victim, you cannot create, you cannot produce, you cannot produce knowledge because what knowledge are you going to produce? That you're a victim all the time or that you want to change that situation so that you're in charge. Uh, and so I think she was very good at helping us to separate the ideology of male dominance from religious ideology so that we can think of those two things and where they come together to affect women's lives. I know, I know time is very limited. Uh, I just want to summarize because Fatma is very vast and sometimes you have difficulty knowing exactly how to, to do this. Um, I think that the other thing I want to mention is that Fatima was also very big on mentoring of young people. And we've all been looking at that issue of mentorship and uh, helping 
the younger people to become better, to become better leaders. And one thing I want to say about mentoring is that I think in Africa we need to be careful. Once you're a mentor, don't just walk away. Stay with the mentor. Because you, you, you don't want to just harvest that training and then walk away and never connect. Because that really affects how things, uh, how you be, how, what kind of a leader you become. Now, I must conclude. I know uh, Professor Hendricks is very... Yeah, I, I, I tried. I want, to, I want to conclude very quickly. I want us to be on a calmer note. Because there's a poem that I wanted to read, a short poem um, for Fatima. It's a poem by a woman called Lana Finnegan from Jamaica. And it says, I am free. And I'll just read it very quickly. Do not grieve for me, for I am free. Do not be burdened with sorrow and pain. I wish you the sunshine of tomorrow. I could not stay another day to laugh, to love, to work, or to play. For I have severed good, good friends, good times, and loved, a loved one's touch. Perhaps my time seemed all too brief. Do not lengthen it with undue grief. Lift up your heart and share with me. God wanted me now. God set me free. Thank you. <laughs>